The documentary film you're about to see, Soar to the Sky, was produced over 20 years ago to describe our wonderful tradition of kite flying in Bermuda. Although the original film quality falls short of today's high definition resolution, CITV presents it to Bermuda in the interest of preserving our rich history and culture. And now, Soar to the Sky. With his eyes on the sky and his hopes on the wind, and since the dawn of time, man has been intrigued by the mystique of flying. From the fragile wings of Icarus and Delators to the launching of space shuttles, it has been man's quest to soar like the birds. The very first probing into the wild blue yonder began with frail sticks, crude paper and cloth, in other words, a kite. The exact origin of kite flying is unknown, although it is said that they were invented in the Orient thousands of years ago. The Greeks, it is believed, also flew kites in the ancient city of Tarentum. Through the centuries, kites have played major roles in religious customs, children's games, and even farmers have used them to forecast the weather. But throughout it all, the simple joy of kite flying was never lost but rather passed from generation to generation and symbolized with exotic toys and works of art. Asian legends tell of noisy kites, which were flown at night to frighten the enemy, who believed that the noises they heard were evil spirits. It wasn't until the 18th century, however, that kites began to have more practical uses. Most of us are familiar with the story of Ben Franklin, who used a kite and a key in an experiment to demonstrate the properties of static electricity during a thunderstorm. Perhaps we should call him Lucky Ben because he is extremely fortunate he was not electrocuted. Definitely not the kind of experiment young children should try at home. The invention of the radio provided more uses for kites. They were used to hoist antennas to great heights to transmit the feeble signals of the day, including Morse code. Scientists and tinkerers alike began to experiment with kites that could lift heavy loads. Sometimes this included people. This was the prelude to gliders and eventually the aircraft. How kite flying came to be a Bermuda sport was just a matter of eventuality. Specifics on the subject are about as clear as Mills Creek. Ask any senior citizen and you would get as many stories as there are senior citizens. There is not much written material on the subject prior to the 1940s. The Bermuda kite seems to be about as native as Bermuda shorts, being known in the kite world as the Bermuda headstick kite, with a few variations. Similar designs can be found throughout the Caribbean and Latin America, although the Bermuda design seems to be unique. The Bermuda headstick kite could, however, have its origins in the United States. This 19th century etching shows an American flag kite. The design is almost exactly that of a Bermuda kite. Whatever its origins, the tradition of flying kites on Good Friday seems to be without parallel. The tradition has religious ties. No one seems to know exactly how this came about, but several stories seem to converge on this. Some time ago, perhaps at the turn of the century, a Sunday school teacher was attempting to explain the resurrection of Christ to a group of children. The teacher flew a kite from one of Bermuda's many hills. When the kite reached a sufficient altitude, the teacher cut the string and the kite was allowed to drift away out of sight. Another religious connection involves the flying of English eddy kites or melee kites, locally known as fishtails. These kites bear the symbol of a crucifix. The absolute truth to these stories cannot be proven and frankly Bermudians don't really seem to be concerned. Perhaps the mystery of the origin of Good Friday kite flying in Bermuda has in itself a certain magic 
that helps to perpetuate this wonderful part of our heritage. How the two world wars affected kite flying is unclear, but scarcity of materials and the seriousness of the world condition must have had an effect on the tradition. But the 50s and 60s were surely the greatest times in the tradition. Perhaps this is due to the lack of television and other distractions. Kite shops and parish festivals were all a part of the celebrations on this great day. Everyone was either a spectator or a participant. It is our hope that in this series of programs, we can help recapture that lost spirit of excitement that many Bermudians had on past Good Fridays. A cool spring breeze early in the morning with the vivid aroma of freshly baked hot cross buns and fish cakes. Church services and even a game of alleys make for one of the greatest holidays in the world. of a Bermuda head stick kite begins with the selection of the sticks. Years ago, the sticks were cut from an old wooden box or any scrap wood available. Today, many stores throughout the island stock kite sticks in several lengths. Shown here are the 30-inch sticks. Kite makers refer to the sticks as spars, but in Bermuda, kite sticks seems to be the preferred name. We begin by selecting four sticks and inspecting them for knots. This is important. Knots compromise the strength of the kite. The kite we are making today is a standard H design, probably the easiest of all the designs to make. Three of the sticks are measured from the center and marked. The center stick has two inches cut off each end so that the beam of the kite measures 24 inches. Some kite makers prefer to move the center measurement of the cross sticks so that the kite appears top heavy. This is a matter of choice. However, a center measurement will lend to more stability in the air. The next step involves the notching and drilling of the sticks. At each end of the sticks are notches to allow the string to rest in the groove. The two cross sticks are drilled at each end for the bender to be installed and for the tail loop to be attached. The head stick is cut to allow it eight inches to extend beyond the top of the kite. This is for the hummers, or buzzers. For safety reasons, most kite makers avoid the use of metal when constructing their kites. However, the Bermuda kite requires a nail to keep the sticks in place. A small pilot hole is drilled into the head stick and the center measurements of the center and cross sticks. This is done to avoid splitting the sticks. The protruding area of the nail is cut off and filed to avoid injury to the person pitching the kite. At this stage, the bander is installed onto the head stick and into the previously drilled holes. The arc is about two to three inches, but it really depends on the wishes of the kite maker. This raised portion of the Bermuda kite forms a small dihedral and adds a stabilizing element to an otherwise flat surface kite. Now the kite is ready to be strong. Some builders use what's known as lining string, which is white. But for this kite, good old brown string will do. Carefully, the kite is strung around at first, and then without curing the string, the pattern is strong ending with the hummer strings, and finally fastened to one of the top cross sticks. At this stage, the frame is complete. The sides can be measured for accuracy, or a spirit level can be used to ensure levelness. Check the string for tension. You don't want string flopping off in mid-flight. A dab of glue at the notches has a little extra insurance against this. By now, you will have some idea of a collar scheme. This kite design works well with just two collars, but a third one can be added. Nothing is carved in limestone. Always apply the lightest collars first. This prevents glue from bleeding through the, and ruining the finish of the kite. 
Shown here is the time-tested method of creasing in tissue paper over the string and the sticks. Another method of obtaining the patches or panels is to precisely measure every angle and pre-cut your patches. Be careful though, any measuring errors could send you around the bend, especially after cutting the patches. White school glue and paste form will do. Years ago, the norm was a paste made from flour and water, or even cornstarch. This became a delicacy for Bermuda's national insect, the cockroach. Sometimes, cayenne pepper was added to the mixture to turn away this pest. For best results, cut the patches in a drawing board with a single-edged razor. It cannot be stressed enough that young children should be continually supervised during this process or given round-edged scissors to do it. After cutting a patch, carefully apply glue to the string and the frame, taking care to use the glue sparingly. Remember, light colors go on first. Now we are almost finished. All the patches are in place. All that remains are the hummus and the tassel of flour. The hummus vibrate as the wind hits this kite. They can be made from scrap tissue paper. Take a piece of tissue paper, fold it in half, and then in half again, as shown here. Then cut in a shallow crescent shape. After unfolding, you will have two hummers, one for each top side. Take another piece of tissue paper, but just fold it once. This is for the rear hummer. The narrower the hummer, the higher the pitch. So for a harmonizing kite, you can half the width of the rear hummer and go down an octave. The flower tassel is made in a similar manner. Instead, use a bigger piece of tissue paper about the size of a 45 record, fold in half. And then again, and then once more. Cut patterns in the paper at random, and then unfold. Glue this to the center of the kite. Make one for each color. At this stage, the kite is complete and only needs the glue to properly dry before flying. To tighten the paper, many kite makers hold the kite over a stove flame. This is not always necessary and could tear the paper. Attach the bridle loops as shown here. The kite is now ready for its maiden flight. Use about 30 feet of torn sheet for a tail and attach this to the loop on the tail bridle. Bermuda kites usually need a high start launch of about 75 feet, so have a helper otherwise known as a pitcher launch the kite into the air. And of course, there will sometimes be mishaps, so have lots of patience and some scotch tape on hand for emergency repairs. The kite is yours. The sky is yours. Exercise safety and you can enjoy one of the world's greatest pastimes. So to the sky, we'll be back in just a moment after these safety tips from Belco. Wow, look at the Belco bird flying his kite on the beach, away from Belco power lines, where it's safe and fun. And there's Bird with his friends, flying kites in a big, wide open field. Yes, sirree. Bird knows kite safety. But remember, if your kite does get tangled in the wires, yikes. Call the Belco kite men and they'll come and get your kite down safely. That's the word from the Belco bird, who wants you to fly high and fly safe. The Bermuda Hat Stick Kite is unique to these islands, although similar designs can be found in the Caribbean and Central American cultures. Barbados has a kite which is very similar to the round version of the Bermuda Kite. Bermudians living abroad also maintain the tradition of flying kites on Good Friday, but it wasn't until May 1973 when Bermuda's Kite King, Vincent Tuzo, became recognized worldwide. He set a record for the longest officially recorded flight, 61 hours, 25 minutes, as stated in the Guinness Book of World Records, 1974 edition.
the Bermuda head stick kite has standard dimensions, but it also has numerous variations and styles. One popular style is the Ron kite, or Rani or Mooney, as it is more commonly referred. This is accomplished by using five or even six sticks. This kite also needs a longer or double tail for stability and has a majestic look in the sky. There's also H and A designs, double or tethered kites. Sounds very scientific, doesn't it? Another popular design is the double or multi head stick version. By using a thinner stick for the head stick, it can be bent slightly, making what is known as a bend back. The multi head stick kites are usually draped with buzzers and decorative tissue paper. The buzzers or hummus, as they are best known, are glued to the string of the head stick. They resonate with air currents, causing a mournful wail in the sky. The more narrow the hummus, the higher the pitch. The Bermuda head stick kite is a source of pride and joy to a Bermudian. But there are other kites made and flown on Good Friday. One kite, usually constructed even before traditional wood sticks go on sale in the stores, is the original Bermuda Boxy. In days gone by, this was usually the first kite Bermudian children learned to construct from dead fennel sticks and brown paper resurrected from paper sacks or even newspaper. However, since the advent of plastic trash bags, plastic is the preferred material. The original boxy was made as an emergency or quick kite with the sticks pushed through slots cut in the paper. It is such a simple kite that it was almost guaranteed to fly. Kite flyers have mastered their own style in the art of pulling and soaking or sailing a kite. They also pride themselves in the special loop known as the bridle in the kite world. A pulling loop gives extra tension and louder humming. A mounting loop provides increased altitude. And seasoned kite flyers prefer that good old brown string any day over any other kind. Bermuda's nine parishes has its own claim to fame regarding kite making, neatness, size, and airworthiness. One such kite is the infamous Somerset kite. Not very glamorous, but extremely loud, high pitched, and wily. It is constructed with a head stick frame, shortened beam stick, brown paper covering, and thin brown paper hummer. This kite is also known as a buzzer in other parishes. It is usually of one color, is loud and small. As with most sports, competition is paramount. On Good Friday in Bermuda, the highest, loudest, and prettiest kites command the most attention. Not seen much today, as in years gone by, is the art of kite fighting, where sticks and tissue paper 
were turned into aerial combat machines with kite builders deliberately building fighting kites. Now the fighting kite was made with a longer head stick and shorter tail which was laced with double-edged razor blades. The kite was made to dip and dive into and across other kite strings in an attempt to cripple or cut loose the other kite. Sometimes a sage bush or cedar bush was tied through the end of the tail to add to the stability. The kite fight was over when one or both kites plummeted to the ground. The majority of battles reportedly were kamikaze. Fortunately, the danger involved in these fighter kites resulted in the practice of dying a natural death. Flying high, way up in the sky. Hold your kite, watch your line. Don't get it all hitched up with mine. My kite flies higher than everyone. While I eat my fish cakes and hot cross buns. If my kite should break away, it would spoil my good Friday. Flying higher, way up in the sky. Hold your kite, watch your line. Don't get it all hitched up with mine. My kite, flying high, way up in the sky. If my kite should break away, it would spoil my good Friday. My kite, my kite, flying high, flying high. See it flying, see it flying, way up high, way up high. Goodness gracious me, look, look what's happening. Man, man look, watch your, watch your kite, watch your line. You can get your line all this stuff in mind. Oh my goodness, man, man look, look what you're doing. We're causing my kite to crash. Oh, man, oh, watch it. Oh my goodness, Chris. oh man, oh man. the Belco bird flying his kite on the beach, away from Belco power lines, where it's safe and fun. And there's Bird with his friends, flying kites in a big, wide open field. Yes, siree! Bird knows kite safety. But remember, if your kite does get tangled in the wires, yikes! Call the Belco kite men and they'll come and get your kite down safely. That's the word from the Belco bird, who wants you to fly high and fly safe. Time certainly does fly, and as people grow older, some traditions and skills are lost or modified to suit the times. 
Fortunately, the Bermuda kite has withstood the test of time. In years gone by, the Bermuda kite commanded the Bermuda skies, and Breezy Good Fridays produced colorful symphonies. It's a sight that die-hard Bermudian kite makers looked forward to each year. The advent of lightweight, durable plastics brought the assemble in one minute, or ready-made plastic kites or bird-style kites that assemble quickly, fly in light breezes, and can be launched with ease by a young child. All in all, Good Friday is a truly enjoyable time for all Bermudians. The day begins with church services for some, kite flying for others. There is laughter and some tears. A breezy day, blue skies, homemade codfish cakes, hot cross buns, and even enjoying a rowdy game of alleys, that is, uh, shooting marbles. Today, Bermuda kite makers agree that the Bermuda kite seems to be somewhat of an endangered species as it fights for airspace in an overcrowded sky full of plastic. But they are convinced that the Bermuda kite will survive as long as there are those who love the tradition, the craft, the art of kite making in Bermuda. With their help, we can ensure that this great part of our heritage remains with us for generations to come. We certainly hope you've enjoyed this presentation once again of Soar to the Sky. We certainly hope it rekindles enthusiasm for this great tradition. Remember the safety tips and have a great safe flying experience. <laughs>